Hey everybody, my name is Eric Bridgeford and I'm a current fourth year PhD student in the Department of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University. Today we're going to be talking about community detection and unsupervised learning techniques. So for this lecture, we have a few key objectives. We're going to develop some background and network value data, which is going to be introduced to you in the background readings and reinforced throughout the course of this lecture. We're going to simulate a realization from a stochastic block model or SBM. And finally, we're going to detect communities and network value data. We're gonna do this by learning some intuition about the latent positions of a network and how to estimate those latent positions from a real network. We're gonna cover the basics of the K-means clustering algorithm, which is an unsupervised learning technique. And finally, we're gonna explore and evaluate community detection techniques. So the core resource for this book is gonna be a network machine learning textbook that we've been working on. Uh, this basically just aggregates uh, some information, intuition, and techniques that we found super useful working with network value data. The core sections are going to be 2.2.1, which covers the basic installation requirements for the corresponding software package associated with this book, which is called Graspa Logic. The next valuable section is going to be uh, Chapter 4 which covers the basics of network value data, and it's gonna introduce you to the concept of the adjacency matrix. The next useful sections are gonna be uh, section 5.3, which covers stochastic block models or SBMs, 5.4, which covers random dot product graphs or RDPGs, 6.1, which covers the basics of estimation in SBMs, and 6.4, which covers the basics of estimation in RDPGs. So what is a connectome? Uh, so this picture shows the axonal fiber tracks from a diffusion MRI. So a connectome is a map of the wiring in an organism's brain. So when I say map, what we mean, we mean, what we mean is it's going to give us information about different areas in the brain. And when I say wiring, it's going to tell us effectively, you know, which areas of the brain can actually communicate with one another. So the primary thing we're concerned with here is structural connectivity. And basically the idea is, you know, for each possible pair of areas in the brain, uh, does there exist an axonal fiber tract between those areas? So down in the bottom left, we can see something called a parcellation. And so what this parcellation does is effectively, you know, gives us some sort of, uh, uh, it breaks apart the brain into, areas that you know one would typically think you know behave together in some way so for instance we can see this little blue area here and maybe we want to know whether this blue area can communicate with this big purple area up here and so what we do is uh, we form a node right here which is going to be the center of that blue area and then we have another node up here which is the center of that purple area. What we do is we come back and look at this axonal fiber tract map, and we find whether or not any axonal fiber tracts, which start in this blue area, end up over here in this red area. And if the, they do, we say that they're connected, and we add an edge to our network. And so we repeat that for all of the different pairs of regions in the brain and we end up with a brain network where the nodes are gonna be the regions of the brain and the edges are going to indicate whether or not an axonal fiber tract connects them. So how do we actually simulate a realization of a stochastic block model? So if we remember from the background reading, uh, the term SBM is a description of a random network so the real data is not actually an SBM. The real data is a realization of a random network, which is an SBM. When we talk about nodes and we talk about probabilities, we're talking about the random network. Whereas when we're talking about nodes and edges, we're talking about the realization of the random network. And so our goal is to learn about the random network while only having the realization. So we wanna be able to make statements about the parameters associated with the SBM which are the block matrix and the community assignment vector, given only nodes and edges. So now let's check out the Jupyter Notebook.
All right, cool. So I've gone ahead and loaded the package requirements for this particular Jupyter Notebook. And now we're going to get into the code. So to start off with, we're gonna learn how to simulate a realization from a stochastic clock model. So to simulate a realization of a stochastic clock model, what we have to first do is define the actual underlying random network. So in this case, the nodes are gonna be the 70 regions of the brain here. We're gonna denote this little symbol N, which is gonna indicate the number of nodes, and that's gonna be 70. Next is gonna be the community assignment vector, which is Z with this little arrow over it. Uh, the ZI entry is gonna indicate the community of node I, and it's gonna be either the left hemisphere L or the right hemisphere R. In this case, the first 35 nodes are gonna be community L and the second 35 nodes are gonna be community R. The next thing is the block probability matrix, which is gonna be denoted by the matrix B. So in this case for the block probability matrix, what the block probability matrix specifies is given a pair of nodes, one of which is from community K and the other is in community L. The entry B, K, L is gonna indicate the probability that those two nodes are connected. So for this demonstration, we're going to capture a property of diffusion connectomes, which is called uh, within community affinity. And the idea is that if two nodes are within the same community, they tend to have a higher probability of being connected. Uh, in this case, that's going to be captured by the fact that BLL and BRR, which are the probabilities of two nodes in the left hemisphere or two nodes in the right hemisphere being connected, it's going to be 0.5. And concurrently, we have between community aversion, which is the idea that if two nodes are in different communities, they're gonna to tend to have a lower probability of being connected. And that's captured by the fact that BLR and BRL are gonna be, is gonna be 0.25 here. So what that indicates is that if two nodes are from different communities, they're gonna have a lower probability of being connected. And so you can see the block matrix right here, B. Next, we have the probability matrix, which is a matrix which is going to have n rows and n columns. Each of the entries, p, i, j, is going to denote the probability that the node i and the node j are connected. So in this case, for the probability matrix, we can deduce the probability matrix using the, using the block probability matrix and the community assignment vector. So in this code block right here, we're going to just define in Python all the stuff we said above. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to plot the block probability matrix right here, as well as the probability matrix over here. So in this case, each row and each column of this probability matrix is going to correspond to a single node in the network. So there are actually 35 rows and columns in this block. And there are going to be another 35 rows and columns over in this block, so on and so forth. So what we can see is that if two nodes are both in the left hemisphere, they have a probability of 0.5 of being connected. Any pair of two nodes, which are one in the left hemisphere and one in the right hemisphere, they're going to have a probability of 0.25 of being connected. And for any two nodes that are both in the right hemisphere, those are going to have a probability of 0.5 of being connected. So next we're gonna to move to the actual realization of this random network. So in this case, the realization is gonna be something that we would actually observe. So this would be, you know, if somebody gives us a connectome or somebody gives us a brain network. So in this case, the nodes are gonna be the 70 regions of the brain. Again, N is 70. And in this case, the edges are gonna indicate are, two, are the two of the regions of the brain connected by an axonal fiber tract. So as we mentioned before, this is gonna be a, you know, simulating a diffusion connectome. So in this case, we're gonna look at this in the form of an adjacency matrix. And the adjacency matrix is the matrix whose entries uh, A, I, J are gonna be one if the nodes I and J are connected by an edge and zero if they're not connected by an edge. So for now, we're gonna assume that we know the community structure ahead of time, and we're gonna keep the nodes in the same order that we looked at previously. So, we simulated the realization of the random network, and then we're just gonna plot it out and show it against the probability matrix. So what you're gonna notice here is that 
in the actual realization as we could have deduced from the probability matrix. We tend to have a lot more edges between any pair of nodes which are in the same hemisphere, which is this upper left and the lower right. These are called the on diagonal bands of the network. And then we have a lower chance of being connected. And so there's a lot fewer edges in the realization in the off diagonal bands, which are the between community nodes. So this is when two nodes are in different hemispheres. And so, you know, one of the things that you're going to notice immediately uh, from this plot is that if we're given a matrix which is already sorted into a reasonable community order, what, you're, what we're going to tend to see is that, you know, there's going to be a readily apparent block structure when we just look at the adjacency matrix. And so what I mean by a readily apparent, you know, blocky structure is that we can see that, you know, there's this upper left and bottom right squares, which are in fact the communities in this case. So unfortunately, um, you know, when we get neuroscience data, it's very rare that the brain regions are going to be sorted ahead of time for you, unless we already selected uh, the ordering of the nodes to make this sort of pattern apparent. Um, if you don't know a logical ordering of the nodes ahead of time, uh, you have to do a little bit more work to deduce the community structure. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take our simulated network and we're going to just reorder the nodes. Uh, we're going to totally randomly reorder the nodes here. And so when I see reorder, all we're going to do here, so this matrix on the right contains exactly the same, uh, what we would call latent structure. And what I mean by latent is in this case, it's obviously hidden the fact that there are still those two communities. These two communities still exist, but all we've done is just taken the nodes and we just reordered them. So again, if you look at the realization when the nodes are sorted, it's super apparent uh, which nodes are in which community. But then when you look at when they are just reordered a little bit, it's totally unobvious that there are two communities here. So if we want to learn about the community assignment vector or the block matrix as well, uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of work. And that process is known as community detection. So the first question we want to ask for community detection is, in what sense are the nodes from an SBM going to be uh, similar here? And so we remember that the probability matrix, which is the matrix P, is going to give the probabilities PIJ of two nodes being connected. So we're going to introduce a new piece of notation, which is this PI with the little hat over it. And what that's going to indicate is the vector of probabilities for a given node I being connected to any of the other N nodes of the network. So this is an N-dimensional vector here. So we're going to take the probability vectors for nodes 1 and 2, which are both in the left hemisphere community, and nodes 36 and 37, which are both in the right hemisphere community, and the unshuffled probability matrix. We're just going to look at that. And so, you know, our question here now is what do nodes one and two have in common and what do nodes 36 and 37 have in common in terms of the probability vectors? So what we notice here, if we look at this top row and compare it to the second row for node two, they're exactly the same. And it's the same thing for nodes 36 and 37. So the big deal here is that uh, effectively all of the nodes within a single community, remember nodes one and two are both in the same community, and nodes 36 and 37 are in this same community. All nodes within a single community for a stochastic block model are going to have exactly the same probability vector. And what this means, uh, you know, to introduce a linear algebra word that you guys might remember, uh, so the probability matrix is low rank. And in fact, it's going to have a rank exactly equal to the number of communities in the network. So in this case, uh, just to refresh your memory a little bit, what rank means is, in this case, it's going to mean how many vectors would we need 
to express all of the rows or alternatively all of the columns in the network. And to repeat it, uh, if an SBM has K communities, the probability matrix is going to be ranked K. There's going to be one unique probability vector for each community. So why exactly is this the case? Uh, the reason is basically that the probability vector of a node is going to be fully specified, knowing only the block probability matrix, the community of that node, and the communities of the other nodes. Uh, and there's really nothing unique about nodes one and two in the probability in the probability sense. So how do we identify this low rank structure? When we have data which is low rank. Uh, a decent way to identify this low rank structure is through something called a spectral embedding. So what we mean by spectral is that it has something to do with the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the data. That's typically you know, the process of finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors is typically called a spectral decomposition. And by embedding uh, in a very non-technical way, what we mean is that, you know, the data possesses some high level structure that we have, which is the probability matrix. And that probability matrix is able to be described by a much lower level structure, which is the two unique probability vectors. And so what we wanna do is we want a way to find that low rank structure, given the higher level structure and nothing else which the spectral embedding is gonna allow us to do. So how do we start with the spectral embedding algorithm? So typically we're gonna start the spectral embedding with a singular, a thing called the singular value decomposition of the data. In this case, that's the probability matrix, which for a probability matrix P, we're gonna be identifying three matrices, U, sigma, and V. So what we're gonna do, so this matrix U, is expressed right here. This is called the left singular vectors of P. There are gonna be N of them in this case. So we've got U1 all the way to UN. The next matrix is gonna be a diagonal matrix. These are gonna be called the singular values of P. And so the individual entries, sigma 1, 1 is the first singular value. And that goes all the way to sigma NN, N, which is the nth singular value. Then we've got another matrix B here. Again, B is gonna be called the right singular vectors. There's gonna be N of those two. We're gonna number them you know, one through N just like we did previously. And then we're gonna transpose it. And that matrix product is gonna comprise P. So down at the bottom here, what I've done is this expression right here is exactly equal to this matrix multiplication right here. So basically the idea of what's going on is that for P, what we're going to do is we're going to take the sum of the product of the ith left singular vector with the transpose of the ith right singular vector. Okay, so that's going to give us effectively a, a in this case, that's going to give us a matrix here that's going to be n by n. And then we're going to just rescale that matrix by the singular value right here, by the ith singular value. And the core idea of the singular value decomposition is basically that the first k singular values and vectors are going to give us the best rank k representation of p, which we're going to note by p sub k. And so just taking this sum, p sub k here is just going to be the sum of the first k uh, terms of this full expression for p up here, which was from the singular value decomposition. And so, you know, what do I mean by best here? Uh, what I mean is that P and PK are going to be maximally similar according to the Frobenius norm. And the Frobenius norm is very similar to the Euclidean distance or the Euclidean, uh, or the, uh, you know, the Euclidean distance or the Euclidean norm, which you guys, I'm sure, uh, are familiar with. Uh, you, you've probably come across that in a number of domains. Um, but basically, the idea is just that if, uh, Two if two matrices have a small Frobenius distance, um, then they're fairly similar. And if they have a large one, then they are not very similar. So since P is ranked two, if we retain only the top two singular values and vectors, we're gonna get back P. So let's see that right here. So in this little code block, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use NumPy first uh, to compute the singular value decomposition. 
And then we're going to plot P against this representation of P. We're going to set K equals 2 here. So what we're going to see is P and PK are exactly the same. And so, you know, what's super interesting about this particular representation, the singular value decomposition? So we're going to plot next is something called a scree plot. And the idea of a scree plot is that for each of the n singular values, what we're going to do is we're just going to plot the magnitude of those in order. And so the idea of the singular value decomposition is that you know, for each of the singular values, the next singular value is always going to be smaller than uh, the, the next singular value is always going to be smaller. And so in effect, what it does is it gives us an ordering uh, about how important the corresponding singular vectors are for the matrix. So as it turns out, uh, if the singular value is zero, those singular vector, the corresponding left and right singular vectors are not important at all for determining the actual matrix. And so if a matrix is ranked K, then all the singular values after K are gonna be zero. So here P was ranked two. So the third through the 70th singular values are all zero. And so right here, I'm just gonna take this sum, which we saw right here, what I'm going to do is separate it into the first two entries and then the third through nth entry, which I've done right here. And then what I did was I replaced the fact that the singular value is zero. And so that whole term, this whole term is just going to be exactly equal to zero. And so P is equal to this. And so in the general case, if we have a probability matrix with K communities, then P is just going to be the sum of the first K terms of that expression we saw previously. And so here's another interesting, you know, sort of fun fact. Uh, due to the structure of the probability matrix for a stochastic block model, and more generally for a random dot product graph, um, the ith left singular vector and the ith right singular vector are going to be equal for the first k singular vectors where the singular value is non-zero. So since P is rank K, then we can express P now with this expression, where instead of having UI times VI here, the left singular vector times the right singular vector, it's just the left singular vector times the transpose of itself. And so when I just rewrite that as a matrix again, now I have the first K columns of U times the first k entries of the singular value matrix times the first k columns of u now transposed, where uk is this expression and sigma k is this thing. So all of the information about p in this case is contained by the non-zero singular values, as well as the corresponding left singular vectors associated with the non-zero singular values. And so if we have a square matrix here, so remember sigma is a square matrix, right? And it's also diagonal, which means that it only has, uh, it only has entries along the diagonal, the others are all zero. And they're all positive, which means that they have a square root. I can actually take that matrix sigma K and I can express it in this way with two more matrices, which are gonna be these two matrices I'm gonna call the square root matrix. So this is the square root of sigma K. And I can express sigma k as the product of its square root matrix times the transpose of itself. And so when I put it all, when I put this all together, um, taking this matrix P, I would have uk times the square root matrix of sigma k times the square root matrix transposed of sigma k times uk transposed, which is going to end up being, uh, if I were to use if I were to define x as uk times the square root the square root of sigma k, what I would get is that the probability matrix is equal to x times x transpose. And so if you guys remember from the chapter on RDPGs, what this means is that the matrix x is actually a latent position matrix for the probability for, for that particular uh, arrangement of the probability matrix.
And so next, what we're going to do, we are going to define that latent position matrix corresponding to this random network. And then we're going to plot it. And so remember, in this case, uh, each row of this latent position matrix. So again, we have number the number of rows goes from one to 70 for each of the nodes. So there's one row per node of, in the latent position matrix. And what we see is that the for a given community, so this is the first community up top. This is the second community down below. What we see is that the latent position vectors associated with all the nodes in a single community are exactly identical here. And so, uh, you know, basically the idea is if I had this latent position matrix, all I would have to do is look at which nodes have identical latent position vectors, and then I'd be totally done. So remember, we get a network with nodes and edges, and we don't actually see the community assignment vector even. So we have no way to uh, you know, obtain the true probability matrix associated with the random network P in practice. So what can we use in place of the true probability matrix? So the convenient thing is that, uh, as it turns out, the expected value of the adjacency matrix associated with the realization or an SBM random network is going to actually be the probability matrix. So a you know, super intuitive uh, first step guess is, you know, what if we just use the adjacency matrix of the realization of the random network? And, you know, what would that do for us? So what we're going to do next is we're going to spectrally embed the adjacency matrix. Uh, and we're going to assume ahead of time that we don't actually know that the number of communities uh, is k, or in this case, 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to use, first use the singular value decomposition like we did for P. Then we're going to look at the screen plot. And so what we see here is that the singular values, uh, it's really big for the first dimension, still pretty big for the second dimension. And then it starts to really fall off after dimension two. So what we want to do, uh, as it turns out, is that in the general case, uh, we're going to want to find this thing. This is called an elbow of the uh, screen plot of the singular values. We want to identify this elbow. And what we want to do is we want to embed, uh, we want to embed the matrix into a number of dimensions, which is equal to wherever this elbow is going to fall. And again, this is just called an elbow because Kind of shaped like an arm if you look if you look at it like here's the hand here's the shoulder and then you've got an elbow right here so let's see what happens if we were able to deduce the fact uh you know that the number of dimensions we should use is k or is two and that is super interesting uh, when we embed A into two dimensions. So we, we've got the latent position matrix over here. We've got the matrix A embedded into two dimensions over here. So when we look at this, uh, it doesn't quite look identical to the latent position matrix. Uh, particularly, it looks like dimension two is like, you know, flipped a little bit over here. Dimension in dimension two, the first 35 nodes had a big value and the second 35 nodes had a small value. Uh, and, and that's, uh, or sorry, uh, over here, the first 35 nodes had a negative value and the second 35 nodes had a positive value. And that was kind of the opposite pattern over here. That's just called a rotation of the, uh, that's just called a rotation of the matrix. Uh, and that's not super important. Really important thing, though, is the fact that the uh, you know the latent positions, uh, or in this case, S, these are going to be called estimates of the latent positions. Um, over here, you know, these rows of the embedded adjacency matrix 
are very similar for the first 35 nodes. Then we will, when we look at the second 35 nodes, they're all of a sudden much different. So as I mentioned, uh, this spectral embedding of the adjacency matrix is going to be called an estimate of the latent position matrix. Um, there are various, uh, you know, statistical proofs that will show you that if you, as long as the matrix A is, you know, sufficiently large, uh, you're eventually going to get something that is going to be uh, arbitrarily close to the latent position matrix up to a rotation, basically. And so that's pretty much all we're, all we're going to need, really, for the you know the success of things we're going to learn about in this lecture. And so again, what we're going to do is we're going to denote this embedded A into two dimensions by x hat, where that little hat right there, all that just means is estimate. So as you guys could tell, um, you know, one of the things we had to input ourselves was a, you know, a guess at the number of dimensions that we embedded into. Uh, fortunately, there's a couple of techniques that will help us out here. Uh, the technique that we tend to like best uh, is from this paper right here by Zhu uh, back in 2012. Uh, and so what that does is it basically, you know, it takes the scree plot and it uses an algorithm which allows them to, uh, you know, develop a heuristic for a good point uh, at which that elbow occurs. And so uh, the package grasp in the in the software package grasp logic, the adjacency spectral embed class uh, does exactly this for us already. So we instantiate an adjacency spectral embedding class, and then we just fit it with the adjacency matrix. And we're going to take x hat to be the latent positions that are estimated. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, we're going to take this estimate of the latent positions, and we're going to look at it another way with something called a pairs plot. So what a pairs plot does is it allows us to look at a you know a large data matrix which with potentially uh, more than two dimensions. Um, if the matrix has two dimensions, the pairs plot is going to be a two by two series of tiles. So each of the subplots, uh, each of the, the individual subtiles here, uh, the KL subtile is going to be a scatter plot. And the individual points are going to be, uh, there's going to be one per node here. And that individual point, the x coordinate, is going to be the kth dimension. And the y co coordinate is going to be the lth dimension of that latent position. So let me go ahead and plot that out. So again, here, there is a single blue dot for each node in the network. So there's 70 total. And what we're going to see is that, uh, or what we can see, you know, that kind of jumps out at us here, is that in dimension two, we kind of notice there's two blobs in the data. There's a blob over here, and there's another blob over here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cheat a little bit, um, and I'm going to use the true community labels associated with each of those nodes, and I'm just going to recolor the points real quick. And so what's super interesting is that uh, these blobs happen to be exactly the two different communities that we want to uh, be able to uncover. So as we can see here, this blob right here that's in red is all of the left hemisphere community. And this blob over here in blue is the right hemisphere community. So unfortunately, we don't know the community labels ahead of time. That's kind of the purpose of why we're doing this. So what we want to do is, you know, if we could develop a technique which could identify these individual blobs, we might be able to uh, predict which nodes are in which community without knowing, without actually knowing the community vector. And so what we're going to turn to here is uh, we're going to use unsupervised learning uh, in particular, a clustering technique. 
So the problem we want to solve is given estimates of the latent position matrices for each of the n nodes. So these are going to be denoted by a vector xi, because that's the latent position vector for the node i. And then there's just a little hat over it since it's an estimate. We're going to try to predict the community, which is going to be denoted by zi. And again, there's a little hat because this prediction is an estimate for the node i. So the way we're going to do this is with something called the k-means algorithm. So what the k-means algorithm tries to do is, you know, without knowing which points are in which community, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to identify the centers of these two blobs. And we're going to call these individual centers mu1 and mu2. And then what we're going to say is if a point is closer to the center mu1, we're going to call it community1. And if it's closer to the center 2, we're going to call it community 2. So to start with, we need a definition of close, which in this case, we're going to use the squared Euclidean distance, uh, which is just defined right here. And so what that is, is for a vector xi and another vector mu, mu k, the Euclidean distance, which is denoted by this quantity, is just going to be the sum over each individual individual dimension of the latent position matrix. So again, the latent positions here are going to be k-dimensional since we embedded the adjacency matrix into k dimensions. So that's just going to be the squared difference for each dimension between xi and uk. And so how do we actually start the k-means algorithm? So we start the k-means algorithm by initializing the two centers so these centers can be chosen randomly or using, you know, there's a bunch of really great heuristics for k-means to choose centers that work really, really well. Um, in this case, we're just going to arbitrarily pop one in the top left and one in the bottom right. Um, and so the centers, we've got a blue center for community one and an orange center, which is going to represent community two. And so the next step, what we're going to do is for each of the individual you know, these little grayed out points, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the distance to the community two center and the community one center. And then what we're going to do is we're going to decide which center is closest to that individual point. And then finally, what we're going to do is we are going to repeat that process for all of the individual points. Remember, these points are nodes in the network. These are latent positions for nodes in the network. We're going to color that particular node's latent position according to the center that it's closest to. So what we're going to get is something like this. So it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it looks like we're starting to grab the blobs of our data set. And then the next step is we're going to take these, you know, these centers for each of the communities that we have. What we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we're going to recalculate these values. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the points here for the blue one. We're going to look at all the points that are assigned to the blue community. And we're going to compute their midpoint. It's probably going to be some all somewhere around here. And then we're going to update the value of the center to be that midpoint of the blue points. And we're going to do the exact same thing for the orange one. And then we're going to set our center. So we're going to move like this. So again, you can see the blue point took the average value of all of the points which were assigned, which were, you know, quote unquote, assigned to it. And same thing with the orange one. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that the estimates of our latent positions have not been assigned to any communities yet. And now they're back to gray. And then we're going to just going to repeat that process over and over again until the centers stop moving. So we can automate this entire process with sklearn uh, using the k-means uh, class in sklearn. So after that, what we're going to do is we're going to plot our pairs plot again. The estimates, these are estimates of the latent positions, remember. We're going to look at the predicted communities. So what we see here is it looks like our predicted communities do in fact reflect the fact that we have two blobs. We got the this blob over here is in red, and this blob over here is in blue. So how do we actually evaluate a k-means clustering? 
So what we want to do is we want to determine, you know, how well do we actually do compared to the true baseline. Um, and so there's kind of a fundamental issue here, which is the fact that k-means gave us predictions of ones and zeros, which are different from the true labels of left and right. So what we're going to use is something called the adjusted rand index. So with the adjusted rand index, what we're going to do is for each true label, so these are left and right, we're going to compute the number of points which were correctly assigned, which were assigned to each of the different predicted labels, zero and one, and we're going to put together a contingency table. So here for this contingency table, the first column indicates which true label is present. And then for prediction zero, NL0 is going to denote the number of nodes which have a true label of zero of L, which are assigned a prediction of zero. And R0 is going to be the number of nodes which have a true label of R and are also predicted to be zero. And same thing with the predicted label of one. What we're going to do is we're going to call something a success if two items which have the same true label, so two items which are both left or both right, also fall into the exact same predicted label of zero or one. And then we're going to call something a failure if two items have the same label, so they're both left or they're both right, but they fall into different predicted labels. Um, so that would be one of them falls into a zero and the other one falls into a one. Uh, and so the idea basically is that we're trying to find which prediction is most like the true label of left and which prediction, which predicted class is most like the true label of right. Um, and so our, our adjusted random index is basically going to give us a sense of, uh, you know, how homogeneous each of the predicted classes are with respect to some true label. So now what we're going to do is we're going to then take that and adjust it. And so the adjustment is we basically normalize by the numbers of successes and failures that we might expect by random chance. And what we mean by random chance is basically just the points are randomly assigned to a predicted class of zero or one. So the adjusted random index produces a value between uh, negative one, which indicates that there's a uh, very low agreement that is less than would be expected by random chance and one, which is a high agreement, which would indicate uh, that we have a relatively good clustering. We get an ARI that's very close to one, which means our clustering did a good job. And so the final question that we might have is, you know, we did a lot of this stuff basically assuming that we knew the number of communities ahead of time. We knew that we wanted two clusters since we wanted to find communities for a two community SVM. And so in reality, when you are performing community detection, uh, you know, you might not actually know what number of communities or clusters you're looking for ahead of time. And so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to uh, develop a heuristic uh, that's going to basically indicate to us when we've chosen a number of clusters that seems reasonable or good. So we're going to introduce a new performance metric, which is called the silhouette score. So for the silhouette score, we're going to choose a distance metric. In this case, we're just going to use the Euclidean distance again. We're going to let this C sub K denote the set of nodes which are assigned to a community K. All right. And we're going to call the total number of nodes in that community K with N sub K. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to compute a couple of different quantities. So first, what we're going to do is for each node i, which is in a single community k, we're going to compute the average distance between the estimate of the latent position for node i and all of the other nodes which are assigned to the same community as node i. And so basically, the idea of this is, you know, how dissimilar is a given node i all of the other nodes that are assigned to that same community. So what we can see here is this quantity a i is going to be equal to, so the normalizing factor here is n k minus 1, 
because we're not going to count that node itself. And then we're going to sum over all of the nodes which are assigned to the same community as node i, except for the node i, it's, except for node i itself. So this is just the Euclidean distance here. So the next step is for each node i, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the average distance between the estimate of the latent position of node i and all of the other nodes which are in a different community from node i. So the idea here is how dissimilar is node i from the other nodes in community l. And we're going to denote that quantity by b i l here. And so again, this quantity is the exact same interpretation as above. So we're normalizing by the number of nodes in community L. And then we're just computing the sum of the uh, Euclidean distances between node I and node J, where node J is something from community L. So the final thing we're going to do is we're going to find the dissimilarity associated with the community that node I is the least dissimilar from. So what this is doing is we're basically just looking at uh, which community, which of these different communities that I was not assigned, does it happen to be most similar to? So we're finding the closest, uh, we're finding the closest other blob of nodes, basically. And we're going to denote that quantity by di. And so what we're going to then define is this thing si, which is called the silhouette of the node i, in, which is in community k. And that's going to be, be defined by this quantity here. So what this quantity is going to indicate basically is how much more similar is that node i to the cluster it was given than to the best possible alternative close cluster, the cluster it was closest to, the cluster of points that it was close to, closest to, that it otherwise could have been assigned to. And so if the silhouette of the node i is near 1, then node i is much more similar to the points in its cluster than to the best possible alternative cluster. But if si is near negative 1, then the node i is much more similar to points in whatever the, whatever the neighboring cluster was. So finally, if the data set has k communities in total, then the silhouette score is going to be the average silhouette of each of the nodes, which we wrote right here. So now that we have a silhouette score, how do we actually decide uh, what a reasonable number of communities or clusters to find is? So what we're going to do is fairly straightforward. For each possible number of communities that we could have, so in this case, we're going to just denote one of them by the letter capital K. We're going to cluster the estimates of the latent positions to predict the communities. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find the number of clusters, uh, or sorry, first we're going to you know, compute the silhouette score associated with the community assignments. So that's going to be a silhouette score associated with whatever number of communities or clusters we're finding. We're going to denote that with S sub K. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find which number of communities gave us the highest possible silhouette score. And we're going to call that quantity the estimate of the number of communities, which is going to be k hat. So that's all this quantity says right here. It says the k hat is whichever particular k maximizes the silhouette score. So all this is automated for us with Graspa Logic's k means cluster function. So as we can see here, what our silhouette analysis tells us uh, is that the optimal number of communities is going to be two, which is indicated because this produced the highest silhouette score. So what we've, so what we've effectively done is we detected successfully that there were two communities in our network. And as we saw previously, using two communities with k-means gave us great results. So as we saw, the adjusted random index was very high. We got a 0.943. And using two communities gave us predictions which exactly matched the blobs that we expected to obtain. And so the real key take home here 
of everything that we've developed is that absolutely nothing that we developed relies on the ordering of the nodes whatsoever, nor the community assignment vector of the nodes. Because all we did was we took nodes, arbitrary nodes and edges, spectrally embedded, and then we used k-means clustering to learn community labels from those embeddings. So nothing there is going to be order dependent. Um, so next what we do is we repeat, repeat everything that we learned so far on that permuted adjacency matrix we saw previously. So again, we spectrally embed first, then we fit the spectral embedding, and then we grab the estimates of the latent positions, and then we run our k-means algorithm, compute the, and identify which number of clusters has the highest silhouette score. We use that particular, uh, whatever that particular number of clusters is. Uh, and then we run k-means to produce predicted labels. And then what we're going to do is we are going to plot that permuted adjacency matrix. And we're going to plot it alongside these new labels that we got. This is the original, uh, the original shuffled matrix. And all we're going to do is we're going to resort the actual nodes in this case of that shuffled matrix according to pr the predictions that we got. And so, as you guys can see, we have again taken the matrix A after permutation. This is the one with all the nodes all shuffled around. We were able to recover that community structure again without knowing anything about the matrix. So I hope you guys found this informative and helpful. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me by email at ericwb95 at gmail.com, or I'll also be hanging around in the Slack channel. Thank you very much, guys.